you know, to me, Playboy, I guess, was the epitome at that age, not anymore, um, of making it as a photographer. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest. I have Atlanta-based photographer, artist, uh, David Rams. And um, to, uh, to open up the episode, David, I'd like to ask you the same question I ask everyone, which is, how is where you're from shaped the artist that you are today? Wow. Well, I'm from Canada. I'm from a small town in Canada. Um, I think that brings, uh, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's a, a very, very short story. Well, I was very, very, uh, growing up in Canada, America, to us during that time, all of America was high Hollywood. It was warm, it was glamorous, it was where all the beautiful people were. I was a really shy, shy, skinny little unpopular kid in, uh, in grade, uh, I think grade six, the teacher asked us all to stand up and say, what did we want to do when we grew up? And uh, just as a joke, uh, I didn't know this question was going to be asked. I stood up and said, when I grow up, I want to live in the Southern United States and work for Playboy magazine. And uh, the class erupted in laughter. And while I said those words, it was like I had a bubble of protection around me. And uh, I spoke those words, the class laughed, and I, I sat down embarrassed and went back into my own little cocoon. Um, better be careful what you put out into the universe because, you know, many years later, I became one of the main photographers for Playboy without even actually setting out to be that person. It just one thing led to another. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I grew up in the country. I grew up, you know, on an apple farm. Um, quite different from the life that people see me leading right now where I can still consider myself a very quiet, small town, country guy that has happened to act, act, uh, act his way into where I am now. Why do you think when you were in sixth grade, you, you had already kind of thought you wanted to work for Playboy? I wanted to be a photographer. Um, I think it was, I, I've never been asked that. I think when I said it, it was more of a, you know, to me, Playboy, I guess, was the epitome at that age, not anymore, um, of making it as a photographer. I remember, you know, I'd, I'd see my dad's uh, Playboy magazine or two hidden under the bed, or I don't even know if he hid them, but I, I always thought that that was, that was when someone had made it. And it was also just me being a shy little boy, just kind of as a, uh, as a joke you know, saying that I wanted to work for Playboy. Um, at that age, there was a guy named David Chan that was, uh, was one of the photographers and uh, who I always thought, yeah, he probably has dinner with Hefner all the time and probably hangs out at the mansion. Little did I know that that is the man that I actually replaced many, many, many years later. Um, he came by and visited me on one of my, one of my probably my third shoot and uh, was I was back when we were using Polaroids. I was peeling off Polaroids and just throwing them on the ground. And David Chan would be picking them up and throwing them in the trash. And my system was like, would you ever have thought in a million years that this guy you looked up to would be on your set picking up your trash? <laughs> Many awesome. years later. Yeah, how it, how it um, comes for a full circle like that. I um. I listened to one of your uh, interviews and for me, I was a, I was a skateboarder, uh, skateboard filmer, which led me to pick up a camera, which led to photography, digital photography, which led to eventually learning how film worked. And so I kind of worked backwards in my progression towards photography. And, really? Yeah. And for you, you actually, I, I heard that you started because your, uh, your, your dad had the, the dark room. Is that right? Was it your dad? And then no, what what I what did uh, my dad and I built a dark room? I had a little girlfriend up at the cottage, 
and her father, probably when I was 12, uh, he was just a hobbyist and he took me and her brother down to the darkroom and showed us the magic of, of, of printing. And I was just blown away by it. It was like another world to me. To me. Uh, so when we got home after the summer, my dad and I built a darkroom. And uh, uh, once again, being, being very shy, the, the darkroom became my escape. It became my fortress of solitude. It's where I, every night I went to the darkroom and I would stay up and print and print and print. And finally, my dad uh, said, David, you're spending all this money on printing things that I was printing his old negatives. Why don't you go and take your own pictures? And I was like, oh man, I don't want to do that. But I started started taking pictures just to bring back to the darkroom and um, have something to print and process. So I'd be out anything I could find, my sister's friends, family pets, street life, going on hikes, anything I could get to fill up a roll of film quickly, get back and process and print it. Where did you get your first camera? And what kind of, what was it? This episode of The Creative Truth is sponsored by Colas Modern, a family-owned art and design studio focused on producing contemporary furniture and home decor based right here in Savannah, Georgia. The company is owned by David and Lara Colas. David is a former podcast guest. So if you haven't listened to that one, go check it out. All of their furniture and home goods are designed and manufactured right here in Savannah, Georgia, handmade, uh, including this coffee table, which is like an absolute favorite of mine. So if you're looking for a personal gift with a story behind it, you can check out some of their unique cutting boards, so like their butler board, their cleaver board, or their fruit board, and more. You can follow them on Instagram at shopmodernheritage or find them online at shopmodernheritage.com. That's on Instagram at shopmodernheritage or online at shopmodernheritage.com. Heritage.com. My first camera was an Olympus Trip. Uh, my second camera, which I still have, covered in dust, and this was my second camera. I would love to have the first camera, but this is my second camera, which was an old Ryko, I guess they call it. But this was my very, very first camera. Uh, did they, uh, did Ryko make their own film or were you shooting on uh, Kodak? No, I was shooting on, this is a 35 millimeter. Okay. So I was probably, th probably that age, I'm sure I was shooting Kodak. Cool. Um, it wasn't until years later I moved on to, you know, obviously other kinds of film and experimented. Um, actually, as I sit here, I look over to my right and I just told a lie. The very first camera I shot on, this is interesting, was... My dad used to keep have up in his top drawer. He had all his, his father's old army medals and little trinkets. And he had this camera, which is a old. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So this actually, I think, was the first camera I shot on when I was very young. And I don't even know is if it they. It's, 35 it's, millimeter it's, as well? No, it's a. It's almost, it's close to a 120, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's called a back. It might, my dad's from England. It might've it probably came from England, but this actually was the first camera I shot on. So my little he... studio here, my little home studio, which is downstairs. It's like a museum. I don't throw away anything. <laughs> me neither. If someone came to me, including my pictures, if someone came to me and said, David, you took a picture of me when you were 15 years old. I could 95% with 95% surety say it might take me a minute, but I can, I can find your pictures. I don't throw anything away. Yeah. And it's kind of a, uh, you know, that's the beauty of photography is it's a time capsule. So you you preserve that moment. Um, I wanted to just take a step back. Uh, well, I have two questions, but when you actually first came to America, you had envisioned it as being, you know, the sunshine and rainbows and, and, and Hollywood. Uh, did you go right to, to uh, LA or did you, how did you? Connect? No, I never went to, after, after I was a play, well, no, uh, no, no, I, uh, when I first came to America, I, um, I was working for a company in, in Canada and traveling around uh, taking, taking church directories. I don't know if you know what those are. They're little, Pamphlets. They're little, 
they're little, almost like a little, like a school yearbook. Oh yeah, where yeah it's got yeah. everybody's picture. It was like a church would have their picture uh, day, <laughs> picture day, and you'd go and you'd photograph all the families. Uh-huh. And uh, so I did that. I traveled around, lived out of my car a little bit. You had your backdrops, and, your, your muslin. Yep, I had a and everything. Big plastic tube that I would carry on the top of my truck with a uh, a fireplace, a canvas with a bookcase. And uh, a fireplace built into a you know, little painted fireplace. And that's what I traveled around with. And I'd go to churches and occasionally a school um, all over Eastern Canada, up into Nova Scotia, Northern Ontario. Um, I loved it. I'm very easily, I have a sense of no matter what situation I'm, I have a sense of, uh, of adventure in anything I do, even if it's something that someone would think was boring. I'll figure out a way to make it fun and 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 adventurous. Um, so that's what I did. And then they were opening up in America, and uh, they knew that I wanted to go to America. So, without doing the pro- proper paperwork, they sent me to America illegally. So I was I was in America working under the table. I would just sneak across the border. And uh, I went to Minneapolis and lived in Minneapolis uh, for right actually at the beginning of Purple, when Purple Rain was coming out. And I, I met Prince a few times. And did you shoot him? No, never, never, never photographed. But I was still doing the church thing. I mm. uh, met him at a party. Um, but was a big fan of his. Uh, side, that's a side note. But anyway, so I, I went to Minneapolis for probably about half a year. And would come across, come, go and come across the border. Then I'd leave and come back and go somewhere else for six months. I got a little cocky at the border and started to, you know, it was, was, uh, became too easy. So each time I went, I'd load up the car even more. And it became very apparent to anybody, this guy's not visiting. He's going there for other reasons. And uh, one of my trips, I was heading down to, uh, to uh, Louisiana. And I was going to stay there for a while. And at the border in, in uh, Michigan, they busted me. They flagged me. They pulled me over. They said, pull your car over here. Come into this office. I went in and they started questioning me. And are you working? And I said, no. And so they said, give us the keys to your car. I gave them the keys to my car. A few minutes later, they brought, I don't throw, once again, I don't throw anything away. They started bringing in these boxes and suitcases. And they started going in through, they had found letters I had written to my grandmother saying, Minneapolis is great. I love working here. So <laughs> here's the uh, immigration <laughs> people holding these. Notes, and I'm like, they're like, what is this? Uh, that was a note to my grandmother that I never sent. What are these uh, pay stubs? And I'm like, well, the company I'm working for in Canada was giving me, borrow, letting me borrow money from them. Anyway, they didn't buy it. And uh, kicked me out of the country. So they just put you back across the border and that was that? Oh, yeah. They they were really rough on me. I was a, probably 21 years old, little granny glasses, very nerdy little naive kid. And they decided they were going to, I remember them putting me up against the wall, having me spread my legs, like putting me up to frisk me. Remember the, the guys, looking back, I probably could have gotten him in trouble, putting his knee in my back and saying, if you move a muscle, I'll break your back. Wow. We're going to make a, 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 a example out of you that you Canadians can't just come into America and think it's your back door. So I, uh, they let me go. They threatened me that they could put me in jail, but they were playing good cop, bad cop. And they sent me on my way. And I, I went and stayed at a little motel in uh, Detroit overnight and called my parents and was crying. And it was quite traumatic. And I still remember that night going to bed and hearing some couples in the next room having sex. It was like, oh God, got up in the morning and went back back home and I had to take a picture of myself holding a newspaper with the date on it, standing in front of a Canadian uh, landmark to prove that I was back in Canada. And the, uh, uh, the lawyer got me out of that situation. And anyway, I kept, kept sneaking back. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, 
finally, while I was visiting or working again, I came down to Atlanta. I, uh, I met a girl and we fell in love. We actually moved back to Canada. We moved to Nova Scotia and we were married. And uh, so I got married to an American, not to come back into the country. So we were going to live in Canada. We just got married to an American. And we lived in Canada for a little while and then decided, hey, let's, let's move back to Atlanta. So now it was legal and uh, came to Atlanta. Once again, got married for love. It wasn't, wasn't to get back into the country. It just worked out that way. So you, so you came, so uh, I, I had assumed that working for Playboy, you were living out in Beverly Hills, but you are, you've no, actually been stationed no. in Atlanta? I have lived in Atlanta and just traveled. I've traveled all over the world. The great sure. thing with Playboy was um, their, the head, their headquarters was in Chicago. Interesting. And they had Playboy West, which was the, you know, the mansion. Uh, but their main headquarters was Chicago. The original mansion was Chicago. Is that where he was from? Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know. If, I'm not sure if that's. I guess that's where he's from. That's where this. That's where the first mansion was. I believe I might be getting mixed up with Bob Gutioni. I should know more about my boss, but I think I think the original mansion was in Chicago. Um, uh, so they did a bit of shooting at that office. They shot uh, a lot of the playmates there. Other than that, shoots were being done all over the country, all over the the world. And so they just and Atlanta's a great hub. Sure. I was I was constantly being flying flying places. Get those Delta. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at one point, I was offered uh, to be a be a, a play to shoot the centerfolds, and uh, turned that down because it's just not my style. My photography is very. If you've looked at my work, it's very kind of organic. I shoot from the hip. It's very uh, shooting a centerfold was more like shooting a still life. It was, uh, it was a very um, laborious, is that the correct word? It was a very, you know, take a couple of days to shoot a, a, a Playmate on a big, uh, large format camera at the time. It just wasn't my style. I just knew, I knew it wouldn't be something that um, I would enjoy doing. You know, you always have those moments though that you wonder, what, I wonder how my life would have changed if I had gone in that direction, moved to Chicago and shot the centerfolds. but. I'm, I'm happy that I didn't. Do you think it's because uh, you like the fast pace and the, the, the movement that's incorporated into your work or, or is, is, yeah, it, absolutely. is it almost like the, is it almost like it gets a little laborious and kind of boring if you're focused on one photograph for like eight hours? Yeah, kind well, of yeah. Thing? So when you're shooting a playmate, uh, well, a centerfold, I shot playmates, but I've, I haven't shot us. I haven't done it. A centerfold shoot. So it's more like you're just shooting basically in my opinion it's like you're shooting a body it's like you're shooting a still life you're not trying to pull anything out of them you're just trying to make a pretty shot um i've always been more in trying to pull something some energy something out of the person by that, that i don't feel you can do in that method i think you need you know a little more interaction and um like i said i shoot from the hip i'm very organic um i uh I like to pull, you know, the person's personality. I like to pull things out of people and show who they really are. Um, I didn't feel like I didn't want to shoot still lifes, and that's basically what shooting a plane, shooting a centerfold, to me was just shooting, was shooting like a still life. Um, when I, you know, photographer, the, the the term is so broad because it can be, it can be commercial, it can be portraiture, and even just within portraiture we're talking about the nuances and it's understanding light and and composition that's not the whole thing for you you've kind of developed this skill to actually pull that emotion out of people and and even see it in people are you walking down the street and you're like oh that person would be fun to photograph or oh that um this location would be like a good uh, you know setting for oh absolutely yeah and it's almost <laughs> that sounds a little dramatic uh but i've said before it's almost a curse because in, in you're always working you're always on i guess yeah. in any art form you're always on you're always like oh man i wish i had a camera right well nowadays with the cell phone you do have a camera all the time 
but yeah, I'm always on always. And it's gotten in the way of my personal life. It's gotten in the way of my, uh, you know, in my relationship, even with my son was that I was always having to document. And when you're documenting, there's a fine line. You mentioned something earlier. I can't remember what it was, but you're documenting a moment that you're going to have forever. Mm, freezing in time. But at the same time, you're kind of missing out in actually experiencing that moment in real time. Because um, you're, you're almost thinking it to the future more than you are living in the present kind of thing. Yeah, well, you're, you're very... Now, and I'll give you an example. My, my son and I, uh, probably five years ago, I took him to a shoot I had in Hollywood. Thought he'd enjoy it. Uh, we stayed at a nice hotel and everything was, it was very swanky and everything was paid for. And I, he got an idea of what, you know, what a big shoot was like. But the thing I was most excited about was after the shoot, was, the shoot was about four days. We were going to get in my car and drive into the desert and get a little roadside motel and rough it for, for, for lack of a better word, just, just explore. Um, and we decided we were going to start, I wanted to go to the Salton Sea. So we left Hollywood and I wanted to get there by, um, before sunset. We're driving from Hollywood and try, I don't know what highway that is, out into the desert towards Joshua Tree and, and the Salton Sea. And my son and I are having great, we are really communicating, really talking. And I see the sun going down behind me and I'm like, got to get there, got to get there, got to get there. We got to the Salton Sea just as the sun was coming down. We probably had 45 minutes of light. My son walks over, sits on a rock, and it's just being very, my son's very, uh, unlike me, he's very, well, I'm quiet, but he's very, he doesn't like a lot of attention brought to himself. Um, even growing up, you wouldn't tell anybody that his dad worked for Playboy. He was very, he's very private. So he just went over and sat on a rock. I got my camera out started taking pictures of everything, took this beautiful picture of him. I love this photograph. It's a silhouette of him sitting on a rock uh, with the colors of the salt and sea behind. It's a beautiful photograph. Got that shot, continued shooting. As soon as I finished shooting, feel, felt like I, I had everything I wanted. I like, okay, Max, let's go. And he got off the rock. We went and found a motel and checked in. And it wasn't until I got home back here a week later I was going through my pictures and, and found this uh, picture of my this beautiful picture of my son and uh, started to cry because I thought I've got this beautiful picture but at the same time I, I lost that moment I could have gone and sat down by my son and um, spent that moment with him but instead I was off taking pictures and when I felt like pictures were done, let's go. And I called my son and I was upset. He's like, dad, it's okay. It's the curse of an artist. And my son being a smart ass, he said, to be honest, if you had to come and sat beside me, I probably would have moved to another rock anyway. Um, that sort of torment has come up again and again and again in my career where I've missed moments because I'm trying to capture the moment so I've missed some moments. Um, last week, I was, I was speaking with Kevin Custer, who used to be my boss at Playboy. He was a senior editor. And I was telling him my, you know, that, about that. And he said, well, you can also look at it this way. The camera is forcing you to explore that area completely. You know, you notice details in that area probably that no one else would notice because you were looking and you had your camera. So in a way you are experiencing, I don't know if I agree with that because I did miss out with that moment of just sitting by my son quietly and experiencing that moment without a camera. Do you think as you've gotten older, you've learned to just kind of like, okay, let's put the camera down and, and be, you know, present in the moment a little more. I've tried to. Yeah. I've tried, I've, I've tried to, um, um, I've got some health issues going on right now with, that has made me really reflect 
on things like that, even what I would reflect before, but even things like that. And uh, I started putting my camera, I, I, I got off social media for a while. I didn't pick up my camera for a bit, but now I find myself almost uh, at, a, at, a, at a heightened wanting to document. I guess all my life I've wanted, it's, it's been about document. I'm, I write, all of my interests is I've always been around documenting things that I can leave behind when I'm gone. I don't know if that's subconsciously why I'm doing it, but all of my interests, maybe that's all the interests, maybe being an artist, maybe that's what it's all about, is, 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 is uh, creating things to leave behind. To focus on, I don't know. on legacy, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it is, it is, and it's also cathar, you know, like this catharsis when you're capturing that, that moment, um, you know, people also just experience things in different ways. So, um, you know, it, it sounds like your son wasn't offended. He just said, yeah, that's just the way, you know, my dad's always been. So and I, and yeah, I yeah. appreciate no, him for it, you know, he's, uh, yeah, no, he's, he's, he was very sweet when he said that. But I do know that because now I've got a I've got a seven year old daughter who uh, Max was around before social media, <laughs> so I was always photographing him with camera and with real film. With my daughter Jansen, it's a lot easier now cell phone social media, and she is my definitely one of my biggest muses. And my son is like, Dad, you're gonna ruin her. Stop taking pictures of her. You're going to make her think that he's, he's worried that she's going to expect people to be giving her that attention all the time with a, excuse me, with a camera. He's like, always like, dad, stop taking pictures of Jansen all the time. Coming from experience, believe me, she doesn't want that. Although she does, she, she loves, my daughter loves being in front of the camera. Max never did. I don't know how many pictures, starting from probably the age of five, I've got so many pictures of Max like this, with his hand up. Uh, I want to take another step back. How about um, your, your dad had the camera. Were your parents uh, artists? Were they creative at all? Um, was your dad uh, just kind of a hobbyist? Or why did he have that camera? Everybody had a camera. Yeah. You know, everybody had a camera. My dad's an interesting fellow. My dad... Uh, uh, my dad was born on the day the Second World War broke out in, in, uh, it was in England. Um, his mother gave him the middle name of Warrior to hopefully give him that strength. I've actually got Warrior written on my arm after my father. Um, and then my, my father grew up in a war-torn England and his, his father was a was, uh, uh, killed by the Nazis, he uh, came on a ship over to Canada, dropped out of school when he was 15 and started a construction company and has done very, very well for himself in Canada at a very high level, like doing the big, big commercial buildings. And he's retired now, but I'm saying all that to say, my dad's always been a very, he's a businessman. He's very, but at the same time, I remember us driving out into the country, him and him and I, myself and my sister, and we drive out to the, uh, there was a swampy area where he'd pull over to the side of the road, the dusty country road, and we'd look for frogs and uh, turtles. Well, my dad would sit in the car and write poetry. My dad's a brilliant writer. So he's not as much with immigrants. My dad's not a photographer, but he, he I think, is, even though he's got I always get left and right hemisphere. Which one is uh, the analytical and which one is the... I believe your left brain is the analytical side and your right brain So my dad's is... very, he's very analytical on the left side, but he's also very, very, he's got a very creative mind in his writing. His writing is brilliant. His poetry is brilliant. Um, so I get that from him. I get that artistic, uh, I think I get a lot of that from him and my mom. No one was a painter. No one, I had an aunt. My mom's sister, um, who is a painter, um, she ends up being uh, uh, schizophrenic, very, very 
schizophrenic and uh, I remember watching her paint and it was beautiful. And she gave me my love for wanting to paint. Um, so I tried to emulate her. I remember painting and drawing a lot as a child, but I guess I was never that good at it. So the next step was well, maybe, maybe pictures. And then I've already told you how I got into the photography. Um, was, was any of that analytical side imparted into you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, and I use that as an excuse all the time. And people are like, David, you can't keep using, even at your age, the I'm an, I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's your, uh, that's your ticket out of uh, all sorts of social engagements. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it really is. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, the photography for me was, it was art. It was also an escape. It was also, I wrote something the other night. I was listening to, uh, I listened to a lot of podcasts and interviews and documentaries. And there was one about uh, um, um, Marvel Comics. And they were just, they were going into talking about, which I found really interesting, that DC is, is a lot older. And where Stan Lee, um, how he wanted things different was with DC, it was always about the, uh, the superhero. It was always about Superman, uh, Batman. Yeah, DC. With Marvel, he wanted to incorporate their alter egos, Peter, alter egos, Peter Parker. Uh, um, Clark Kent. Or no, that Clark was Kemp, Superman. That's DC. Yeah. But he wanted to show you know, Peter Parker was neurotic. He had pimples. He had, he wanted to show the that these are just real people. Yeah. And that's where Marvel made a, made that difference. Now moving forward, DC, I think has done the same thing with the new Batmans and they show a lot of, which I find it fascinating. I'm saying all that to say, I was like Peter Parker. I was this quiet, nerdy, neurotic little kid. Uh, he got his spider powers that, when he had those, he became a different person. My spidey powers was my camera. When I had my camera, I was a different person. And it gave me purpose. I could be somewhere and having a camera would give me a purpose, a reason to be there. I could, I don't know if I could say I was, could hide behind it, but it, it gave me a purpose in life. You know, I could be at a party and not be embarrassed about quietly sitting by myself. If I had my camera, I had a purpose there. It, it, it is interesting that uh, I'll, I'll, people say, I, I didn't even know you were there. I'm like, I was in the middle of the room with the camera. People almost, when they see the photographer, they almost kind of like gloss over you. And it's a great social tool because you can say, oh, sorry, I can't dance. I can't jump in the pool. I've, I'm taking exactly. pictures. Or on the reverse side, you can go up to a group of strangers or a group of, of women and say, hey, can I take your picture? And that's the way to like, to either oh exactly to navigate social scenarios using it as a tool exactly and that's that's a big part of it too i mean and i tell people now although people look at me and they're like you're not shy i still think of myself as a really very shy person that has just learned how to act not shy you know when i was Is there a bit of imposter syndrome there about a bit of what imposter syndrome that you you feel like you're you're faking uh you know being this oh social i did character. for a long time yeah for a long time i thought with my photography for a long time up until oh 15 years ago or I, I i thought i was imposter an imposter i thought I'm, I'm tricking everybody i'm getting lucky um and then a few things made me realize no i i when i realized under any situation, I can come off, the power can go off in a building, it can rain, it can throw anything at me and I can make a beautiful picture. It was kind of during those days that I realized, okay, I am a good photographer, I do. That is something that I, that I own very proudly now for a long time. Hmm. And I think that might be common with uh, a number of artists. I remember watching a documentary with uh, Michael Hutchins, Hutchinson, Hutchins from NXS. And okay. uh, listening to him speak and his words, I was like, I knew exactly how he felt that he thought he was fooling everybody. You know, he thought it was, you know, one of these days, I think it was him, 
that he'd be, they'd find out he was a big fake. So an imposter syndrome, I've never heard of that before, but yeah. Do you have any advice to uh, artists, artists or aspiring artists that kind of have that, uh, that feeling of, oh, I'm going to be discovered one day that I have no talent or whatever? How do you kind of like work through that? What's the word? I don't know. I have, I have blind, is it? Knowing what I know now, I would never in a million years, it's blind, uh, blind, um, naive, blind, I was delusional almost. Uh, knowing what I know now, I would never have gone to interview for Playboy magazine <laughs> because I was, I had this little shoddy portfolio with what I look back at the time was college rated photography. There's some great not dishing, dissing, uh, college people but I had a college portfolio with a little bit of fashion in it because I've been shooting catalog work there's some amazing photographers out there that logically I'm like why would I even try for that there's something to say for just being naive and being young and let's do this um and once again just had it in my head that okay I can make this happen you know, I was anytime anything's been thrown at me, um, I've always I've been lied. I've just been like, yeah, I can do that, and was like, I'll figure that out later how to do it. I had a, 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 another interesting story about seven years ago because my daughter was just being born. Uh, there was a pro basketball team, a street they do street ball, which is like a, a much the rules are a little different. It's a much more aggressive version of basketball. Um, and it was an international team. They were coming through Atlanta and they had heard my name from somewhere, the, the lady from uh, California. And she contacted me and she said, your name has come up. Do you do sports photography? And I lied and I was like, yeah, of course I do. I don't even know about I, sports are so. It's, it's funny watching me watch a football game or a basketball. I do. I know nothing about sports. So here I am saying, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, know how to, I know how to do that. I think the most I had done, I, I photographed my son playing basketball when he was a little boy. And I think I had photographed a girlfriend's younger brother playing football. That's the extent of my, my, uh, my sports photography. So they hired me. They were coming, they said they were coming through Atlanta. They were gonna be playing at the uh, big, stadium here i'm not sure which one it was it's downtown or oh, you're in you're in, you're you're not here so it's the big one of the big stadiums for where they would play basketball and so they wanted me to show up uh kind of at a rehearsal at, a, at a practice photograph them in the in the change room photograph everything going on and also playing so i did all that got on the court with them um the next morning and i loved it i got really into it um, the next morning I handed in the images, um, kind of sheepishly because I, I thought they were good, but I wasn't sure handed to the men. And the next day I got a call and said, Hey, um, we were going to hire a photographer in each of the cities when we traveled around America, but we really love your stuff. How would you like to tour with us? You could keep all your regular gigs and every Friday we'll fly you to wherever we are. And you'll stay with us till the following month, till Monday. And I was like, hell yeah, that's, that's a great day. So I started doing that. Um, a couple of gigs in, we were up in Harlem. And we were waiting for the, uh, our, the limo to pick me and the owner up. And the owner says to me, I work with a lot of photographers. I hate saying that. I feel like I'm bragging, but I'm not. He says, I work with a lot of photographers. And he's like, you're really good at this. And I finally said to him, I've got a secret for you. It's like, what's that? And I was like, I know nothing about sports. I don't really even know the rules of basketball. I've never shot sports before. I've shot a little boy playing football. And he said, really? And I'm, I said, yeah. And I said, but I figured out why you like me. And he's like, what, why, why? I'm like, well, I take a different approach. I shoot a lot of rock stars a lot of actors. So I'm really good at making, 
I feel like I'm really good, man, woman, even a younger person. I'm really good at making them look like a rock star. I also have shot a lot of dance, like classical dance, ballet, and we're shooting dance. It's mm -hmm. all about, you've got to, if, if you see that, that moment and you take the picture, you probably missed it. You have to kind of know where the moment's going and be there to catch it if you follow me. So I said to him, basketball, in a way, it's like dance. They're running, they're jumping to the nets. They're, there's a lot of dance in that. And I said, what I feel like I've, I've done, you like me because I'm making your players look like rock stars. And at the same time, I'm really capturing them when they're playing like dancers. And uh, he really got it. He was like, no, that's absolutely. He's like, yeah, because no one's ever photographed my, my team. And you really make them look, you make them look badass. You know, I'd go to dinner with them, lunch. I'd be on the tour bus with them um, in the change room. And I love my favorite kind of photography is, is that, is just capturing real life moments. I'm, I'm great at directing, at posing, but my favorite thing is to, uh, I've had also celebrities hire me just to you know, fly me out to Vegas, uh, for instance, and just be with them, shadow them from the time they wake up in the morning to document their day. I love doing that. You um, know, that's... For, for the basketball stuff, were you shooting film back then or is this all digital? This is all digital. Okay. So you were able this to kind of get some instant feedback and be like, okay, I got something here that I can turn oh, in. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have. And that, that moved on because then the guy started up a... Uh, he's a guy that was with... Uh, uh, the guy that started it, uh, was with Capitol Records, and then I produced, or I think he produced some sitcoms over the years, and then started up a basketball team. Um, he grew that into a sports apparel. So a few years later, he was hiring me to actually do fashion photography um, for his sports apparel, where I was shooting pro pro athletes in uh, in apparel, mm. uh, and that was a lot of fun. So that was a good gig, but like all good gigs, they all eventually come to an end. <laughs> and then something else comes up. Something and new. something else comes up. Well, well, you were kind of in a hub of uh, hip hop in uh, in uh, Atlanta, and I I saw on your portfolio, I saw Outkast, CeeLo, I saw I see Migos, which is kind of a newer act. Um, do you personally actually listen to uh, hip hop music? <laughs> <laughs> I listen to all music. If it's good, I listen to it. I used to be like, no, nah, I don't like rap. I don't like country. I don't like anything. About now, if it's good, I listen to rap. I listen to country. I love some kind of Willie Nelson, some Johnny Cash. Uh, I love classical. I love opera. If it's good, I love rap. If it's good rap, um, I, I don't know if I should be saying this. I, I'm not a big fan of the music Migos make which is bad because probably my best friend, my bro almost my brother, he dropped by last night, um, is the, he manages the Migos. Um, I've got some funny, funny Migos stories because they are, they are a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> they are, yeah. They are, and I've gotten mad at them. I've, I've done the old, listen, uh, I would, yeah, I would like play the older, older guy, older white guy card and be like, you don't have to act like that. Um, <clears throat> okay, dad, right? You know, like, okay, yeah, we're getting in trouble. Yeah, with the we, uh, we were in, uh, I was hired to shoot, uh, do some uh, promotional shots of them. And they were shooting a music video uh, down a little five points, which is a kind of urban not urban, kind of a cool, very artsy part of Atlanta. And they were doing a, a music video down there through the night. And uh, I was asked to come do some PR shots, but on white. So that I'd set up kind of remotely in a little house there. I shot up, I set up in a little room uh, where I could just get far enough back to, to do a picture of them on white. Um, so I set up there. And I, what I do with someone like the Migos, I shoot them as a group. But a lot of times I will shoot uh, some of these groups 
as well, I shoot them separately so I can, um, you know, take the best of each of them and then put them together into a group shot. So they look like they're all together, but I get the very best. So that's what I did in this situation. So I got there at eight o'clock and uh, so I let them, let them know I was there. Danny wasn't there, my friend, who's their manager, wasn't there. And they're like, no, we want to do the music video first. We'll shoot after the music video. I was like, fuck, I'm all set up. I literally need them for 20 minutes. The music video is going to go on until four or five in the morning. It's eight o'clock at night. And I know they're, I know they're just sitting in their trailer drinking or just smoking, probably smoking weed. So I'm like, well, I'll take advantage of this moment, which I'm glad I did. So I just started taking uh, some great behind the scenes stuff of them doing the music video. Got some great artistic shots that I love. So I'm glad I was there for that. Uh, the, the music video wraps and it's like four in the morning. I go up to their trailer and their, their, their guard is out front. And I'm like, he's a big black guy. And I'm like, hi. I'm supposed to be shooting them so he's like well you know it's coming and hawing and then all of a sudden the doors open and uh the main guy um quavo 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 happens to see me and he goes hey i know you you shot the picture of me da, 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 da. i love that picture come on in so i come in and they're they're drinking and doing whatever they're doing smoking weed I'm like, yeah, I've got to do, as I said earlier, I've got to do these pictures. Yeah, 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 we'll just be half an hour. So I go back to this little house where they've kind of, the producer of the video's at, there, there's he's kind of been an op, a base of operations. And uh, I'm sitting there waiting. Sun's coming up almost. <laughs> almost. Uh, all of a sudden I'm told I've got to take my stuff down because of union. And I'm like, no, no. I've said, I've been waiting, I'll, no. No, it's union rules. And I'm like, well, I'm not part of you. I'm a photographer. I'm not part of your. So I went and spoke to the producer who actually got some work out of her for doing some other musicians at a later date because it went so well. So it's the producer, told her what was going on. She's like, yeah, just stay up there. Waited another 20 minutes. Someone came and said, they're not coming. I was like, yes, they said they would be. All of a sudden, a big black, black SUV comes up. And... Uh, Quavo gets out, or not Quavo, yeah. Take Quavo off, gets out. offset. Quavo, yeah, I get the mix up. Quavo gets out. And, uh, or no, it was him last. Offset or one of them gets out. Or get, get, they, they come up. They are fucked up. <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> so this, we're, I'm in like some old rickety house with these windy stairs going up. And there's still a lot of extras in the house, kind of fans slash extras. So I'm literally taking whichever one it was and leading him upstairs with my hands so he doesn't fall over, putting him in front of my camera and being like, okay, just stand there. Keep your sunglasses on. Click, click, click. Set, oh, set, hold, making sure he doesn't fall over. Click, click, click. Okay, you're done. And then the next one comes up. Same thing, you just, you know, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but not really. Get him in front of the camera. Sunglasses, keep your sunglasses on. Take a bunch of pictures of him. He leaves. Now the, the part comes is dramatic, or not dramatic, but so I'm sitting there. It's about probably five in the morning. I just want to go home. I'm just, I've got Quavo now to shoot. Someone says, Quavo's not coming. And I'm like, I've shot the other two guys. I literally need him. It'll take five minutes. No, no. And I'm like, so I call someone and they, they get him to come out. He comes out, he pulls up, he walks in. He's not happy about it at all. But I won't go into that. It was one of those moments that, you know, I've shot people that are much bigger than you that are so much more polite. You don't have to do me like that. Be professional. Don't, I'm not, you know, we're all, we're all here to do our art. Don't do me like that. So he comes in, I, I don't have to lead him up the stairs. He's in, he's in pretty good shape. Put him in front of my camera, click, click, click. Thanks. Whew. Pack up, go home. About a month later, someone sends me a picture of a billboard in New York. 
And it's the shot from that night of the Migos on a billboard in New York. And uh, this is where I got, I got some brownie points. The producer, I sent it to the producer of the video and sent it to her. And she was like, oh, that's beautiful. When did you shoot that? And I was like, that was the night that all that went down. And she was like, oh my God, you, if anybody knew the story, well, people will know now, yeah, the story yeah. behind these, this picture is that was at this billboard that was up in Times Square, the story behind- What it, take, what it took to get that the shot. What it took to get that shot, but they weren't all standing together at the same time. Yeah. They probably don't even remember the photo shoot. So uh, funny. Yeah, I've got a lot of Migo stories. I've, I've asked Danny before, I'm like, what are they like when they're not high? Like, they're always smoking weed. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what are they like when they're not smoking weed? It's, I, it's, and he's like, I, he travels. He's like, he's everywhere with them. He's always with them. And even he was like, Dave, he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> they, they're, always, <laughs> they're always high. Oh, that's funny. I shot them at a studio, my first shoot. And it was a rental studio. And they came in smoking weed. And I don't want to be that nerdy, older white guy that's like, no, you got to put away the weed. So I was like, fuck it, I'll let them smoke their weed. I actually got some good pictures of them. And the next day, the owner of the studio calls me and is like, I, David, you know there's no smoking in here. I can't get the smell of weed out of this place. I've got, the guy was a photographer, he was like, I've got a, uh, a sweet 16 or something to photograph you <laughs> later. I can't get the smell out of it. Why did you let them smoke? And I'm like, I don't know, it's the Migos and I don't want to be that guy. Still, the, the shy little boy from Canada comes out at me and I'm like, you know, I, I, I want to be cool. I don't want to be uncool and say, no, you can't smoke weed in here. Well, that's also part of like uh, extracting part of their story. You know, you, you want them to feel comfortable. So well, no, you don't want to. Very good point. Yeah. Very good point. Because yeah, I, it was, it was, it was absolutely some of my best shots that night. Uh, I'll send you a couple because you probably were of them smoking with the smoke coming up and uh, some, some of my best stuff. You know, as far as me, you know, kind of uh, pulling things out of people. I hate when people say, or I don't like when people say that they are a, uh, what is it? What is the word when people feed, they, they take other people's energy? Uh, they are, um, empaths, empathetic. Empaths. Yeah. It's a big pet peeve of mine when people say they're empaths, because I found so many times people that say, that say they're empaths are probably, the, they're a lot of times I found them the most self-centered mm whatever. I am an empath though. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. The problem with a lot of times for my shoots, I will take so much of their energy that sometimes I've taken it, I'll carry it around. Uh, maybe it's their mood, whatever it is, I've taken their energy and walked around with it for a couple of days. I shot, uh, I was actually looking him up the other night to see what he was doing now. I shot for some magazine, the guy that was accused of murdering Jam Master Jay. I wanted to meet him beforehand and get, you know, see what he was all about. And he seemed like a very nice guy, but I definitely absorbed that energy. I, I, there's been different times that I've absorbed people's energy, took it home. And my loved ones were like, um, who are you today? <laughs> what is it? You seem like you're off. And, and I'm like, I know sometimes it's just, I will get, I'll kind of lose myself. So there's a fine line of not losing yourself in that person you're photographing, if that makes sense. You know, there's also a fine line of having an ego, but also being a sponge and egoless for them to open up to, but having enough of an ego not to let them completely dominate what's going on. Well, yeah, you have to kind of meet people where they're at a little bit, but you also have to kind of guide the, at least in the, in, in yeah. the photo setting, because it's like, oh, no, we've got nothing to work. Like, it's all good. I know we only have five minutes or 20 minutes, whatever, but like, you can just relax and, and, and then make people feel confident and comfortable. And uh, so, yeah, it's a little bit of, 
meeting them where they are, but also you, you sometimes have to be the, the, the white guy in the room and go, look, <laughs> I got to yeah. get this shot, you know? And as far as you, you're, I mean, you're doing the same. When I first, when I reached out to you and then we, we, we communicated briefly online and I was like, don't you want to, you don't want to talk to me first. And you were like, no. And I think that's sometimes where I've, where I have gotten my best stuff, where I'm just like, let's organically. I used to do a couple of years ago uh, during downtime. It was like a form of giving back. And it was a form of exercise where I would just meet people. I'd be at the grocery store or I'd be in an elevator and say, Hey, I'm not, it's, this isn't a scam to get money. This isn't a, I'll give you half an hour. If you want to come to my studio, I'll do a cool portrait of you. And it was an exercise in half an hour. If I could take a perfect stranger and pull out of them who they really are. Um, I've always found just organically let things happen. Even in my, even modeling, not me, but when in directing, I'll, uh, you know, when I'm directing models, I'll usually start out with kind of letting them do them. And then I casually start kind of try this, try this. And I ca I'm constantly talking because I find a lot of, some photographers I know they'll sit behind the camera and they're very quiet and click, click, click with me. I think silence breeds awkwardness and uncomfortable. Mm. I'm constantly, constantly talking and giving them um, uh, positive reinforcement, which isn't a lie. When I'm photographing anybody, I, I feel like I am seeing the beauty in them and I want to let them know how good they're looking or what I'm picking up from them. Um, and then that's what, that's what they give back to me. Um, even in lighting, I don't like to overlight. I'd like to first see what, I won't say what God gave me because sometimes it's a, I'm pointing at a lamp, but sometimes it's, it's what is either outside or inside, what is ambiently happening in this room before I um, overtake it with my fake lighting. I like to see first, what is this like giving me? And then I'll kind of try to help it along a little Supplement bit. It. And keeping and keeping the energy and the light that um, comes in the room. Some of my greatest photographs, I'll feel the, the uh, my partner has a picture upstairs of a, of a it's actually an ex-girlfriend, a model that I shot in New Orleans. It's a beautiful picture. And people are like, how did you like that? And I was like, actually I took, a floor lamp and another floor lamp and moved it in close to her face and did this i didn't even use you know i like i like kind of using organic oh, i know the exact picture you're talking about she has very little catch light in her eyes i think i know the one you're talking about very yeah warm. it's very yeah 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 very very haunting she's very shiny uh yeah. we've decided to jessica loves that picture and people think it's it's a huge picture like it's in a big ornate frame and it's probably about, it was in storage and she saw it. She was like, can I hang that up in my place? Uh, and I was like, you want a picture of my ex-girlfriend? This is from 20 years ago. She's like, yeah, I just love it. So she's got it up there. And then the other day she finally, and I've got many beautiful pictures of Jessica. Finally the other day, she was like, I think I'm it's time for me to, you can take that picture back. Maybe we'll put a picture of me in it. And she's like, some, some of my friends are like, it's, might be hanging on to your past a little bit too much or something. It might be just not the right energy to have a picture of your ex-girlfriend. Um, so I'm going to take her, <coughs> Hannah's picture out and put a picture of Jessica in there. But yeah, it's probably the one you're thinking of. But so much of my best stuff is the, the uh, you know, the stuff that just ha happened organically. That's why I don't, I don't tend, I don't worry I used to go into shoot worried about what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And now I don't worry because I know no matter what, it always organically finds its, I always find my way. Always totally. find my way. No matter what, if there's a horrible storm, as I look up my window now, I'm on the 19th floor and it is white outside with mist. It's quite beautiful. Um, but yeah, that's enough. went off, off on a tangent. But yeah, even... I've been through every lighting situation, power going out, storms. I always, equipment failure, I always find my way. Well, you're a great storyteller visually. You're also a great 
Uh, I've loved all the anecdotes you have uh, so far in this call. So what can people kind of look forward to in, in the book that you're working on? And what were some of the motivations behind uh, starting that project? Well, I've done, as you've probably seen a few, I've done a lot of, there's been a lot of stories written on me and interviews over the years. And um, every time I've done one, I've, uh, the journalist or the writer has always been like, you should write a book. And I always go into these interviews kind of nervous, um, but they organically just come. Like I remember, I think one of my first interviews, I met at this little diner up in Canada and I sat down across from the guy and uh, he asked me a question and I went on for 15 minutes. And I was like, am I being rude? I'm not letting you get a word. He goes, no, this is great. Um, you know, for a very short article. And we ended up talking, I think for three hours when CBS came here, when Half died, it was, I think a two minute little thing on me talking about Half. We spent three hours up here talking because I just go off. I, 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 and they've always been like, man, you should write a book. So I, uh, I started writing a little bit over the years. And then when the, uh, virus you know that i started getting into a little more and then um recently uh about four months ago i've i've, I've got uh i've been doing chemotherapy so it slowed me down i've got uh, cancer in my liver which i'm doing very well i've got about another two months of chemo but it really awesome. slowed me down in my shooting mm -hmm. uh but at the same time it's been i can't say it's been a blessing but it really makes you reevaluate and look back on things. And the writing is always something I've put off to the side. Now this has given me a chance to really get into my writing and pull out all these, as I mentioned earlier, I've got archives from when I was 15 years old and every picture brings up another memory. So I've got all my archives out. And even last night I had to force, I knew I had to be up to do this with you and be on it. And I was up last night looking through through pictures going, oh my God, what a great story here. I'm putting it, making a note, great story. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, also, I do a lot of mixed media. I've been working on my mixed media photography um, and I am shooting again. Um, so that's my energy as God was having, the chemo was causing long amounts of time of being tired. Um, and now my energy is coming back and I've realized there's probably eight days a month that I can shoot. And I did a shoot for the first, I did two shoots for the first time two weeks ago. And it was so emotional because for the first time in four months, I forgot I had, that I was sick. People talk to me afterwards. They're like, oh my God, you sound like the old David again. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I need to do this. So I've uh, oh, lost the video. Um, sorry. You're good. There we go. Phone call coming in. So I've, uh, yeah, I'm going to be shooting. I've always got, now I'm, I'm getting calls all the time. And now I'm finally able to say, yeah, I can do it. Uh, so I'll be shooting. But yeah, my main right now, my main uh, uh, is, is uh, curate, curating, photographing more. But kind of working on this book. Do you have a um, timeline for the book? Or like a, you know, a goal date? No. Probably should. My next step is I need to get an editor. So if you don't know to get edit, I need to get an editor to go through it. Um, I've read it. I've read chapters for a few writers, for a few writers. And I know you could say, well, they've got to say that to you because they know you, but. I'm a rather hard on myself because I'm not a writer, but anybody that's read a few of my chapters have been like, oh, this is really, this is really good. Um, my son and I get along great, but uh, we've had, as a, any, you know, you have, a, you, we've had some, some moments. I sent him a few chapters of things I wrote about from, from when he was young and he was like, oh my God, God, dad, this is, this has helped me so much understand you. And he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to call mom and see if she'll write too. 
because it just helped me understand who you are and what you were going through. Uh, writing has also been a great, great therapy for me because it's made me realize writing it down and going through it. I'm like, oh, this is why I do that. This is, this is why it's funny. I was writing about the summer that I, uh, it's really, I, I won't go into it. It's a little, it's a little blue as my mother would say, but in writing, I realized the summer that I've, discovered the the uh the dark room is the same summer that i was taught how to french kiss during a game of truth or dare where i was 15 no i was probably 13 and an 18 year old girl showed me how to french kiss and then said now you can do that to your little girlfriend and she watched and it was also the same summer that i learned to masturbate so I'm like, there was something about that summer that was very, I discovered from my, taught my love for the dark room. I learned how to French kiss and I learned to masturbate all in the same summer. So I'm writing about this and realizing my book is going to be, I'm finding a lot of my kind of more interesting stories are the ones from when I'm younger. They're kind of a coming of age, especially when you add into the fact the person that's writing this goes on to be a Playboy photographer. Yeah, the Playboy photography uh, stories, they're going to be more. Sorry, I'm just getting rid of this. There we go. The Playboy stories, it's going to be a whole other. I've been writing about them, too. They're very titillating and very wild and crazy. But I'm actually most proud of the stuff pre-Playboy and the adventures living out of my car where I shot photographed, uh, uh, was photographed around the, around, around the country, America and, and Canada living in church basements and living in my car and those adventures I find much more interesting than the adventures with Playboy. But the Playboy stories will definitely bring on a different demographic, de de demographic of people who want to read it. So let's say they invented a cell phone that allows you to call back in time to leave a, uh, I usually say voicemail, but answering machine message to your 13 year old self you can leave a 60 second voicemail to, to yourself when you, you know, that year when you were uh, discovering, you know, yourself, what would you say? Wow. A couple of things come to mind. Don't do drugs. Number one, that would definitely be, uh, God, that's a that's a very easy but tough question to talk about. I uh, I tend to compartmentalize things. I guess that's the right word. And some people know this, some people know that. Just being more of an open book, being more transparent. Um. being more, is it discriminating in who I allow in into my life as friends? Um, professionally, I don't think I'd do anything different. I could say I didn't need college because I learned everything I needed to learn uh, uh, through other photographers, but the artistic journey I've had on oh, be more mindful of money, learn a little bit more about the uh, analytical things that I should have been more, you know, I don't know if that's what you're looking for or what's, you know. Um, well, it's for you. It's, for, it's to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when, when, uh, when I realized I had, uh, um, cancer my uh i didn't uh, back back when it was i was in the hospital my uh baby's mother my, my partner jessica had to uh contact a lot of my friends and my family to tell they didn't know if i was gonna be coming home luckily I, i'm i'm here in front of you and i'm fine but 
she noticed something very odd. She said in calling a lot of my friends that she didn't really know, she realized how compartmentalized that this best friend doesn't even know about that best friend. He doesn't know Peter Parker. That, yeah. She said, you have, you're very, her word wasn't compartmentalized. For a long time, I didn't know what that meant. I remember doing a documentary on James Brown and them talking about how compartmentalized, is that how you say it? He was, and I never really understood what that meant. And uh, I'm very guarded. Some people know this about me. Some people know that about me. My family knows this about me. She found out a lot of fam my family didn't know this and this and this about me. They were always wondering what was you know going on with me. I'm very close with them, but I'm very guarded on who knows what. If I had to go back, I'd be more of an open book, more transparent and more uh, not be like that. Great advice. Um, and also probably a lot of parents say this. This isn't maybe to a 13 year old, but I was, I was very close to my son. But when he moved to New York, I remember thinking and I was saying goodbye. I remember being and I know all parents probably think this, but I was like, God, if I could go back and not have gotten a babysitter that night or hugged and kissed him more or held him more or spent more time with him or go sat down on that rock with him and looked though, you know, those are the important things, you know, spending time with your family and your friends. Professionally, I would do it all again. So how can people listening uh, learn more about you, stay, stay up to date on what you're working on and, uh, you know, and, and discover more? Well, uh, my Instagram page, I've got two Instagram pages. I'm also in the midst, I started this the other day because my website is kind of, we started working on it last year, redoing it. Um, and I'm right in the process of rebuilding it. And I want to start putting um, links to, um, 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 oh my God, the word's kind of right in my head. I want to start doing a podcast maybe with someone in, like, like you and I are having, but it's hard for me to start and tell my, my stories, but maybe have a, a podcast and each week I'm talking about a different, a lesson I learned or this story or that story. So I want to put that on my website. I want to put my blogs. That's the word I was thinking of. I want to start keeping a blog, which are basically kind of be excerpts from my book. Um, and that's davidrams.com. Right now, that website isn't there. It's just, it's my pictures. Uh, but I want to build that into a bigger platform where it's got my podcast, my uh, blogs, my writing, and my photography. Oops, sorry. Oh, you're good. Spam call. Um, so yeah, it's my, my, my uh, Instagram page is David Ram Studios. That's all my work. My uh, personal page, which is mostly family, a lot of pictures of my daughter, is David Ram's photo. And I used to have them as one because I thought people that know me, they want to see. I thought it was interesting seeing, you know, my world that goes from my daughter to a Playboy shoot to a rock star shoot back to my daughter. I thought people would be interested in that. And uh, I still kind of incorporate that in my personal page, but then I decided I, I should separate the two because a lot of clients don't want to see pictures of a seven-year-old. Then, <laughs> you know, so I have those two sites, but my, uh, yeah, I've got those two pages and davidrems.com uh, where I'll be, we'll be housing a lot of those things. Um, anyway, it's been very, very enjoyable talking to you. Thank you. You too, David. Yeah. So in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. Uh, if you have episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can email me at hello at creative-truth.com, which is working again. And uh, you can learn more about the podcast at creative-truth.com. If you're listening on iTunes, please don't forget to leave me a good review. Thank you to everyone who has already. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to please like, share, and subscribe. Um, David, thank you again. And Thank you. Yeah, thank and you we'll, very much. We'll, uh, see, we'll see you in the next episode.